Hello, everyone. Welcome. I'm Young Lee, and I'm the president and CEO of the Damon Runyon Cancer Research Foundation. I'm also proud to say that I'm a former Damon Runyon Fellow. It's my pleasure to welcome you to today's webinar, which will feature Damon Runyon scientists supported by our Quantitative Biology Fellowship Award. You'll hear more about the importance and impact of this award in just a moment. Damon Runyon's mission is to support young scientists conducting innovative and bold research projects. We enable them to take risks and pursue novel ideas that have the potential to make breakthroughs against all types of cancer. I'm honored to now turn over the program to Dr. Todd Golub for opening remarks. Todd Golub is the director and founding core member of the Broad Institute and of MIT and Harvard. And he's also the Charles A. Dana investigator in human cancer genetics at the Dana-Farber Cancer Institute, as well as a professor in pediatrics at Harvard Medical School. Todd is also a member of the Damon Runyon Board of Directors. And he's also the chair and inaugural, inaugural committee member of the Damon Runyon Quantitative Biology Fellowship Award Selection Committee. Todd, welcome. Thanks, Young. Good afternoon, everyone. Um, great to have you uh, on this call. Um, you know, this is such an amazing moment in the field of cancer research. It, it feels like I, I tell, you know, young people all the time that this is we're entering a golden era for cancer research that I think is going to be like no other because of the explosion of insights that we're having into cancer biology and cancer genetics and cancer mechanisms and proof of concept that one can translate those insights into therapeutics that actually benefit patients, which is what the goal of the Damon Runyon is, is to, in the end, invest in young people so as to benefit patients. Um, but if we think about where are those great breakthroughs going to come in this golden era, I think everyone would agree that a huge component of the big breakthroughs in, in, in cancer research are going to come at this intersection of cancer biology, cancer medicine, and computational science. And if you believe that the role of computational science is going to be really integral to the future of of uh, breakthrough cancer discoveries, then we need to worry a lot about, do we have uh, enough leaders in this field at this intersection of cancer biology and, and computer science? And if not, we should be investing in a new generation of leaders uh, in the cancer research field. And that's the intent of this really special program in uh, quantitative biology. Uh, founded on the idea that to get this right, you can't just be excellent in computational science, but you also need to understand the biological problems you're trying to solve and have deep connections into the world of cancer biology and cancer medicine. And so this new fellowship program is a mechanism to bring these two worlds together, to identify creative, young, ambitious people who are curious, not only about their own fields, uh, typically coming from a computational perspective, but deeply curious and uh, thirsty and energetic in, in the world of, of cancer biology and cancer medicine. And so the structure of this fellowship uh, program ensures co-mentorship of, of bo by both cancer biologists and computational scientists. And it was really thrilling to see the level of interest in this program uh, in its inaugural uh, year um, and continuing um, to, the, to the current year. Um, this is, um, you know, it would be possible that, you know, you have programs like this that don't garner a lot of attention, quite the opposite here. The competition was, was fierce. And so the fact that uh, we're going to be hearing from the three winners from this year's uh, competition for the fellowship, uh, everyone should be proud of that because it reflects not only their great um, science and, and achievement, but the interest in this uh, field generally, which I think bodes well um, uh, for the field uh, in general. So I couldn't be more pleased with 
um, the program as it's going so far and its potential uh, for the future. And I'm excited to hear about uh, the, the work of this year's um, awardees. So I'll turn it back to you, Young. Great, thank you so much, Todd. Um, as Todd just said, um, Damon Runyon's investment in this um, in this area of computational um, science uh, bridging with cancer biology will create a very elite cadre of these of leaders in the computational biology space. And we're so excited to invite um, three of them to present to you today. Um, so as Todd mentioned, um, uh, our three scientists who are with us today um, are recipients of the first uh, group of these awards and they were selected in the spring of 2020, um, right as the pandemic was hitting. Um, um, so we truly appreciate their resilience um, in being able to continue with their important work during this time. Um, just one quick housekeeping comment before I turn it over to our scientists to, to present. Um, please submit your questions in the Q&A box at the bottom of your screen. And after the three scientists present, then we will um, be glad to welcome um, our moderator for the Q&A discussion, um, Dr. Caroline Uhler. And um, she will lead the conversation with our scientists and will address as many questions from the audience as we can time permitting. So I'm pleased to first introduce um, our, our first scientist, uh, Siting Gan, who is working under the mentorship of Drs. Joan Massaguet and Donna Payer at Memorial Sloan Kettering Cancer Center in New York. Siting? Yeah. Um. Uh, thank you so much, Young, for the nice introduction. And um, hello, everyone. I'm really honored today uh, to be here and share with you my work in cancer. And first of all, uh, a little bit about myself. Um, so where do I come from uh, scientifically? Uh, I did my undergraduate studies in physics in Peking University. Um, and then uh, because of a strong interest in biology, um, transition to systems biology for the PhD training, where I study the, our internal pacemaker called the circadian clock and how the circadian clock can coordinate the physiology to the natural time of the day. And typically, uh, the circadian clock can be prop properly reset uh, to different new time uh, given a change in the environment like how we would typically readjust our body to the new local time if traveling to a different uh, place in the world. Um, and what I said is interesting is when the clock cannot be a property reset in the simplest organism known to possess a circadian clock called uh, the, cyanobac uh, the cyanobacteria. So as shown here in this movie, this population of bacteria that initially divided from the single one will lose synchrony post certain change in the environmental temperature uh, and therefore be uh, set to different stochastic circadian time. And from there, I also built mathematical models to interpret the re experimental results and go back and forth to provide a quantitative understanding of this interesting phenomenon. So uh, thinking about uh, the transitioning from PhD postdoc, I've been always really interested in having the freedom of going um, between different approaches, experimental and computational, and bringing them together to achieve uh, an accurate, a quantitative uh, a picture of the biology I'm studying. Well, coming into postdoc, I did transition from studying this elegant circadian clock of a simple bacteria to a far more complex problem, which is cancer metastasis. So metastasis develops uh, as primary tumor cells disseminate through the blood circulation to seed and colonize different organs. And for what I'm focusing on, which is metastasis to the brain, it frequently develops uh, in all cancer patients and often so in breast cancer and lung cancer, uh, which is what I'm focusing on. And despite this high incidence of uh, cancer metastasis to the brain, it is actually uh, 
an inefficient process if we're looking at individual tumor cells. And the reason is that even after invading to the brain, uh, most tumor cells will have died because their overall surroundings in the brain, as we call it, tumor microenvironment, can be extremely hostile to the invading tumor cells. And this microenvironment is very complex. It's composed of diff many different cell types and also uh, non-cellular components like fibers of collagen that will interact with each other. And understanding how all the various components interplay with each other holds the key to understanding brain metastasis and to finding potential new therapeutic targets for suppressing metastasis. To study uh, this problem in depth, uh, we use uh, MOS models where we can uh, inject tumor cells isolated from primary tumor in patient into the mouse and analyze the metastatic uh, tumor lesions growing at different organs and for me uh, in the brain. As shown here in this um, cutting edge uh, light sheet microscopy movie, uh, you can see in the green signal, uh, which is uh, the, the tumor cells that they grow along this intricate uh, blood vessel architecture inside the brain, while being embedded shown here in the purple signal, uh, resident uh, immune cells of the brain that's called microglia. And to be able to uh, really identify, specifically identify the tumor microenvironment, we engineered uh, the tumor cells to be able to express and secrete a protein that lights up when excited and can also be taken up by the neighboring uh, microenvironment cells uh, as shown, uh, presented here. Well, this little dot here in red is the, the labeling protein that we engineered the tumor cells to express. Well, in addition to that, they can also express many other signaling molecules that will affect their neighboring uh, microenvironmental cells and the vice versa from the microenvironment cells to the tumor cells. In addition to this communication between the cells, they can, the cells can also remodel the overall microenvironment by depositing, for example, here, the non fibers of the collagen. And uh, in addition to what's captured in this simple cartoon here, uh, the whole uh, system is as complex as what I, I showed earlier, composed of many different cell types and also non-cellular components. And what we really want to tackle is to take a very systematic approach, combining uh, experiments with modeling to understand exactly what, when, where and how the cells interact to mediate the progression of uh, metastasis in the brain. And with that, uh, I'd like to uh, stop here and thank you for your attention and thank uh, the, this opportunity for, for being a Tamarania fellow and doing this research and being able to be embedded into two amazing academic homes, the two labs I'm uh, joined between with and also two other interdisciplinary scientists I got to work very closely with um, every day. This is uh, like very exciting and thankful for this opportunity. Thank you so much for your presentation. Next, um, we'll be um, hearing from Vitor Mori, who is at the University of Vermont in Burlington um, and is mentored by Drs. Jason Bates and Matthew Kinsey. Vitor? Thank you so much for the introduction, Young. Uh, let me just share my screen. Yeah, is it working? Yes. It looks okay, great. awesome. Uh, so, hi everyone. My name is Vitor Mori. I'm a postdoc at the University of Vermont and a Damon Runyon Quantitative Biology Fellow. It is a great honor to be here and to present our work to you. My project is interbronchial ultrasound guided transbronchial needle injection of cisplatin optimization <clears throat> in heterogeneous lung tumors. So. Cisplatin is a broadly used chemotherapy drug and it's mainly administered intravenously. However, it is very toxic and associated with several adverse side effects. And a systemic delivery of cisplatin exposes off-target tissues to high doses. On the other hand, 
And tumor delivery is an alternative that allow a high concentration of cisplatin within the tumor while you're reducing health tissues exposure and recurrence after chemotherapy, surgery, or radiotherapy is common in lung cancer. And the treatment options are limited for those patients, which is mild improvement and significant rates of adverse effects. So intratural injections of cisplatin emerge as a salvage therapy for those patients with very limited uh, alternatives. So here we have a video made by Olympus simulating the procedure. You have the bronchoscope introducing the patient's airway and it travels until it finds the lesion. The ultrasound probe guides the needle and cisplatin can be given intratumorally. Uh, uh, this procedure is already under use at the University of Vermont and the University of Florida. And out of the 37 treated patients, 71% of them showed partial or total response with just mild uh, uh, side effects. So in the left here, we have a recurrence lung cancer in obstruction of the right lower lobe in a patient that previously received radiotherapy. And following treatment, we observe an improvement in right lower lobe and distal airways patency. And the patient also report relief of dyspnea and chest pain. Uh, although the preliminary results are promising, there are still several questions to be answered concerning a more personalized treatment strategy. So is it better to use a single injection or a multiple injection strategy? What are the best places to give the injections? Uh, what is the role of the tumor's highly heterogeneous microenvironment? What is the ideal dose? And how does the drug behave immediately after the injection? So we decided to target those questions with computational and mathematical models. And we first approached the number of injections and the optimal locations. And the model we developed considers a tumor to have a boundary defined by segmenting a 3D CT scan of the chest. Uh, so the tumor is discretized and represented in the model as the superposition of two distinct spaces corresponding to the extracellular space and the intracellular space. So following the injection, the cisplatin diffuses within the extracellular space and moves irreversibly into the intracellular one, exerting the cytotoxic effects. And cisplatin is simultaneously cleared from the extracellular space by the tumor perfusion. And according to the model, the drug covering the tumor relies on a competition between how fast cisplatin can spread around and how fast it can be cleared. And we found that this competition is shifting the drug clearance direction. So delivering cisplatin and multiple injections have a significant effect with a roughly three order of magnitude reduction in the total dose. Also, the model associated with an optimization algorithm can give us the optimal location based on the tumor morphology and the total number of injections. Uh, the next step would be assessing the impact of tumor heterogeneity in the diffusion process. Our plan was to perform experiments in lung tumor to the organoids, but due to COVID-19 and the impossibility to carry experiments in the lab, we decided to assess those in first. We evaluated a set of 32 patients with non-small cell lung cancer that received 10 to 40 milligrams of cisplatin intratumorally. And it's worth mentioning that the 10 to 40 milligram dose was empirically said as 40 milligram is close to the maximum tolerated dose. So from the tumor CT scan, we applied our previous developed model with tumor volume ranging from 0.95 to 229 milliliters. And what we found is a power law relationship between tumor volume and the total dose for tumors up to 40 milliliters. So actually, we might be overdosing small tumors posing unnecessary side effects while possibly underdosing larger ones with the current one-size-fits-all approach. And also for small tumors, one injection might already be enough, while larger tumors tend to benefit more from a multiple injection strategy. Also, we have two tumors in the data set that are much larger than the rest of the group, one with 152 milliliters and one with 229 milliliters. And even though only a small fraction of those tumors were covered with cisplatin, according to the model, both did respond to treatment. Uh, well, 
Larger tumors that are associated with poorly vascularized areas significantly impairing systemic chemotherapy as the drug is unable to reach certain areas of the tumor. And indeed, tumor necrosis is associated with a poor prognosis. Uh, on the other hand, the absence of vessels, it favors intratumoral therapy as the drug remains confined in the interstitial space for a longer time. And that raises the question of whether uh, uh, tumors with large necrotic or hypoxic areas might be good candidates for intratumoral therapy. That's something we plan to explore in the future. Uh, in the past few months, we have been working on assessing the initial drug distribution immediately after injections. And to do so, we have been investigating images from the ultrasound probe attached to the bronchoscope to guide the, the injection. Here we have a color enhanced ultrasound video and drug movement was segmented. Uh, we can see here the tip of the needle and the drug spreading around from the needle. And the shape of this wet from is linked to the injection regimen. So for example, a quasi-static infusion would imply a spherical symmetry around the needle tip in a dark sea flow profile. On the other hand, the faster injection regimen, as seen in the video, it shifts the center away from the needle tip and might suggest a, a compliant expansion of the tissue, creating a pocket where drug accumulates. So the core question here is whether we can control that initial drug distribution to optimize tumor recovery, coverage by just changing the flow rate during the, the injection. And that's uh, our next steps are to uh, keep the investigation of the role of initial drug distribution and how we can control and predict it. And we also plan to resume experiments to assess the role of tumor heterogeneous microenvironment and how it would affect diffusion, dosing, and the choice of the injection locations. So I'd like to thank the Damon Runyon Cancer Foundation. And Damon Runyon has been very supportive and understanding on the hurdles we all have been facing under this uh, unprecedented times. And I'd like, to, I'd like to, to thank my mentors, Dr. Matt Kinsey and Dr. Jason Bates for the support on this ongoing project. Thank you so much, Peter, for sharing your work with us. Um, our next speaker is Hang Xu, um, who is at Stanford University School of Medicine and works under the mentorship of Drs. Christina Curtis and Calvin Kuo. Hi. Thank you for a kind introduction. Uh, let me share my screen. Um, is actually everything okay? Yes. Okay. Um, it's a great pleasure to be here and to show my work. Uh, so my interest is in chromosome instability in tumor evolution. Um, so um, all stories start from evolution. So when we talk about evolution, we usually think of Darwinian's uh, theory of species of origin. So that said, in an um, um, individual, there are random mutations arising in the genome some mutations may provide some advantages, for example, to help individual to better adapt to the environment or help individual to survive or have more offspring. Um, and later individuals that have such mutations will be selected by our nature um, and gradually differences between the individuals uh, that are caused by the mutations will grow bigger and form different species. Um, and cancer development within an individual is also an evolutionary process. And in many ways, it mimic the species evolution. So cancer starts from um, a normal cell. So this normal cell can acquire a first mutation that makes it a bit like, look like a cancer cell. And this cell will start divide, dividing maybe more rapidly. It may become less sensitive to the mechanisms that suppress uh, cell division and it may divide to uh, many cells. Uh, as mutations constantly arise and being selected, new populations of cancer cells will uh, arise and some cancer cells will uh, gain the ability to travel. So that's uh, where metastasis comes from. So uh, 
classic model of cancer development is through accumulating the mutations. So these mutations usually uh, affect only a single gene or single trait. So like in this example, uh, the butterfly's color and the pattern is changing gradually over time. So this could happen um, or caused by a single letter change in the uh, genomic sequence. So, but there are also other types, like there are examples uh, in a more punctuated pattern. So we call it um, Marco evolution or large leaps. So uh, such large leaps normally involve um, chromosome instability. For example, the numerical uh, chromosome instability that changes the number of the entire chromosome, again, or, or loss of the entire chromosome, um, and also there are structural chrom uh, uh, chromosome instability where a large piece of the chromosome could gain or lost or even translocated into different places. So you can imagine that during this process, um, hundreds or thousands of genes can be affected at once, which is crazy. Um, so here I'm showing you an example of a highly rearranged genome uh, or from an uh, osteosarcoma patient we have. Um, so here each color represents a different chromosome that should be in a normal genome. And we know in a normal human genome, there are 23 different pairs of chromosomes. But in here, we can see there are much more copies of the chromosomes. Um, and when you see uh, there are multiple colors here, that means the segments from uh, different chromosomes were translocated and then combined together. So you can see in this genome, there are many translocations going on. And astonishingly, we found a genomic sequence that have jumped into 12 different chromosomes. So they are labeled here. Um, so these, uh, each of these uh, uh, arrow is, uh, is a, a jumping segment. So in this segment, it, uh, it contains a gene called MIC, uh, which is an oncogene that promotes tumor progression. So it's very obvious that this MIC gene is amplified through chromosome instability um, um, in this way. Um, so we can see that chromosome instability could drive tumor development by amplifying oncogenes like MIC or deleting uh, tumor suppressor genes and create aggressive tumors. Um, however, chromosome instability is a double-edged sword. So you could imagine that a cell that's suffering uh, tens to hundreds of genomic rearrangements will be expected to die because um, these rearrangements could uh, result in uh, a complete loss or disrupt um, of uh, some essential genes. So uh, the cells that survive in such insult and progress to become cancerous must have a significant fitness advantage that makes them to um, tolerate the um, crazy chromosome instability and to compete with the normal cells in the same environment. So we want to know what fitness advantages of the cells to, could have gained and how the cells could tolerate such large amount of genome uh, aberrations. So we are analyzing a large scale of cancer patient genomic data, and we want to identify um, the patient with the chromosome stable tumors and those with the chromosome instable tumors. And we want to explore if there are any potential factors like genomic level or um, uh, RNA expression level, is there any factors associated with the chromosome re uh, rearrangement level here. Um, and also, I want to mention that in with the um, uh, chromosome instable tumors, we're also comparing the adult and the pediatric tumor to study the difference um, in how tumor develop, progress, and respond to therapy. Um, and all these tumors um, we analyze. So you can imagine when we sequence them, it's a snapshot of that tumor status at the time. So um, because chromosome instability is a dynamic uh, cellular event, um, we can't, we, it's really hard to directly observe how it um, in the growing tumor, human tumors, because what we sequence is uh, like final, final tumor. So 
to study the how uh, the progress of um, the chromosome instability, we we could use mathematical modeling and the computational simulations to study this process. So once we obtain some essential parameters from real tumors, we could model the process and grow tumor virtually. And by studying um, these um, models, we could gain more insights into um, these important questions and but hidden evolutionary process. Um, and I will stop here and I want to take the opportunity to thank the Ryan Cancer Research Foundation uh, to support my research and also my uh, labs and my colleagues uh, for their kindness and support. And thank you. Great, thank you so much. Um, it's so great to hear from um, each of our three scientists about the work that they're doing. Um, all are addressing such an exciting and important question um, in so many different areas of cancer research. So we'll now move to our um, question and answer session. And this session will be moderated by Dr. Caroline Uhler. Um, Caroline is the newly named co-director of the Eric and Wendy Schmidt Center at the Broad Institute of MIT and Harvard. And she's also the Henry and Grace Doherty Associate Professor um, at MIT in the Departments of en Electrical Engineering, Computer, Computer Science, and the Institute for Data Science Systems and Society. Um, Caroline is um, also an inaugural member of our Quantitative Biology Fellowship Award Selection Committee. And as I mentioned um, earlier, is uh, one of the people that um, worked with Damon Runyon to help select this very um, wonderful group of, of awardees. And so Caroline, I'm going to turn it over to you now um, to, to moderate this discussion with our scientists. Thank you very much, Young, and I'm really excited to be here. And thank you to all the speakers for really wonderful talks. Um, so let's start off with a couple of questions, maybe to Siting first, since uh, your mm -hmm. talk was first. Yeah, so there were questions about, um, so maybe I'll start first with a question about the data sets. Um, so what are the kinds of data sets that you're, that you're going to be using? You showed um, imaging data sets. Um, mm -hmm. So is this the data that you're going to use? And then how do you, there it's usually snapshots in time. So how can you from snapshots in time then infer something about communication between cells? Yeah, so uh, I think the major data sets I'm trying to start working with uh, are time points, uh, time series data of uh, uh, single cell RNA sequencing uh, that um, would initially uh, basically be all the cells uh, involved in the tumor microenvironment that get labeled by this uh, microenvironment labeling system we engineered into the tumor cells. Um, this will be the major data sets. Um, well, in terms of type of data, uh, what I'm also been working on, very excited about is the imaging data. Um, we are also trying to set up, uh, it's been going on, a set up uh, uh, essentially uh, imaging technologies that will be able to uh, capture uh, many of the molecules uh, in the intact, uh, C2, uh, in C2 tissue context. So uh, this is our on the computation, uh, an experimental side. But on the computational side, uh, I think it's, uh, um, I'm at a stage of like exploring the data and trying to think of new ways of looking at it. But the, the time point uh, data would be really essentially something that informing a bit more on the progression of the metastasis and thinking about how the changes in different uh, cellular components vary with each other. And I think that will be something we're thinking about that help inform the interactions among them uh, along the progression. Great, and can you also, another question from the audience, mm -hmm. um, can you say something about maybe particular cell types that would be you know, most important to study? Um, or will you be looking at all these different cell types first analyzing what are the cell types that are there and, and then just figuring out what is the communication between them? Uh, so essentially both are going on. <laughs> That's just, I think why I felt very excited to um, take a systems approach, but also uh, I think being trained as a, 
a biologist that can recognize, can understand the literature and, and spot things if they pop out as like very important uh, mediators uh, that it's worth going deep into the mechanisms. Um, so I would say um, both are going on, <laughs> if that, that counts as an answer. <laughs> of course, definitely. Mm -hmm. Great, thank you, Siting. And then we'll have some general questions to everyone at the end, but let's maybe move on to Vitor first. Mm -hmm. um, so this was really interesting, also another very interesting talk. Can you tell us a bit, little bit more about, you know, you're looking at diffusion. How is the diffusion different in the tumor as compared to other, you know, if you would be looking at other kinds of tissues or other kinds of organs and how is it different in different uh, tumors and what are the important parameters that you're actually using for this modeling? So tumors, they are in general a little more dense than other tissues. And that might directly affect the, the competition between diffusion and perfusion. So indeed, to, uh, the, the aim is to cover the largest volume of the tumor with enough cisplatin to induce cell apoptosis. And if the diffusion process is much slower than the perfusion, then you're gonna lose a lot of drug through, through perfusion and would inflict a lot of side effects, adverse side effects in the patient. So it is very important to, to understand how diffusion acts in lung tumors and even in different types of tumors. That's one of the reasons we plan to, to go deeper on this, especially on diffusion, because it seems to be a very slow process in the tumor and a very important one to drive cisplatin uh, uh, distribution within the tumors. Uh, we also plan to investigate whether there are other ways we can, we can change the injection in the beginning to optimize the initial distribution in order to rely just on the diffusion process. So that's uh, more or less where we are on investigating and our understanding of the diffusion process and how different types of cancers and different types of tissues respond differently to those types of therapies. Cool. Thank you. And maybe another question, I mean, you mentioned how tumor morphology is so important um, for, you know, figuring out optimally where to inject. Um, how is, and, and also tumor volume you showed afterwards is really important. So how would you get very accurate measurements of this, you know, since, since you need this in order to figure out where to inject and how much and what, how to inject? Yeah, we do that uh, with uh, high resolution 3D CD scans. Uh, with those CD scans, we can segment the, the tumor in the chest, and then we can obtain this to, to implement the model. And of course, for very small tumors, that's a big challenge because we rely on a small number of voxels, and we don't have the resolution we would want to, to further and deeper understand of the tumor. So it works pretty well for larger tumors, but it's still a big challenge for a smaller ones. A, very, a, a huge amount of details would like to, to interrogate the, the CD scans, we just can. We would love to have a, a very well-defined map of the blood vessels within the tumor. We know that this is very heterogeneous, but unfortunately it's hard to do that in a non-invasive way. Yeah, thank you. It will be interesting to see how you know, how robust your results are to these kinds of um, things. And at the University of Vermont, are they also working on methods to actually improve um, the imaging? Are you also working on these things at the same time? Uh, right now, we are not really working on improving the, the CT scans, but we are planning to do uh, organoid experiments and ex vivo experiments in dog tumors in order to have a better understanding and maybe with the aid of a micro CT that might help us understand in uh, those processes. Great, thank you very much. So let's move on to the third talk. Um, Hong, so I'd love to also ask you some questions. Um, so here there is another question from the audience asking, you know, is, so for your, um, for your analysis, you'll need to do um, quite a lot of sequencing. So the question is, is this, you know, the standard, is this already included in the standard of care? Um, in cancer nowadays? Um, and, you know, is this the kind of data that is already available and that you will be using for research? And how much is this already used for treatment selection? Right. Um, so uh, first, it's, uh, it's still not the standard uh, care. Um, so the data we are using, the part is from our own lab. It's a whole genome sequencing. So we 
decrease the whole genome every single base pair. Um, and um, uh, we also use public data because there are so many research have done on uh, different cancer types and there are um, databases that collecting this public data and put it out there for researchers to search on. So we also looking on uh, all those public data um, um, for, for, for the, uh, for the uh, questions. <laughs> Great, thanks. And also, can you tell us a little bit more? So you showed like, you know, a very particular tumor instability involving the MYC oncogene. Um, is there somehow different classes of uh, tumor instabilities that are known? Um, and how are they related to, you know, cancer, metastasis, etc.? cetera? Uh, um, so different classes of... Uh, um... Of well-characterized particular mm -hmm. types of, of, um, of uh, tumor instabilities? Yeah, okay. uh, Chromosome instability, sorry. <laughs> yeah, um, so, so uh, chromosome instabilities, you could imagine there is a structural variance, also, uh, also the numeric um, chromosome level uh, differences. So, it's uh, like copy number difference. You can have gain or loss of, uh, of a certain piece of uh, chromosome. Um, also, you can have structural variance. Um, and there are some catastrophic events called some uh, like uh, complexity or chromosome thrifts where um, a certain piece of a chromosome will be chopped into fragments and randomly stitched together. So that's uh, um, just at once. So um, these are a type of uh, uh, variants that happen just uh, like um, at once and, and shuffle everything. Um, I think that's mainly these two different classes um, of structural variants. Um, I think make is an example I showed in osteosarcoma. So that's an oncogene. So we can see it's amplified. And we, um, from osteosarcoma, we analyzed um, there are many actually tumors have this high amplification like MIC gene. Um, but there's also tumor suppressor genes uh, that are deleted. It's not amplified. So when you see the tumors, it's, uh, it's all deleted. It's not in there. But in this way, uh, when we analyze the chromosome instability, like to count uh, which part is amplified, which part is lost, um, because these things are being selected on, right? So we are more easily to find the drivers on the genome. Um, so yeah, through, through uh, analyzing the um, large cohort, we are more easily to find um, the drivers um, that um, um, promote the tumor progression here. And maybe also something that is really exciting that you want to, you know, reconstruct what happens over time. So is there a way for using, because within a tumor, you already have very heterogene heterogeneous cells. So can you use somehow the heterogeneity within a tumor to say something about the events over time? And is this something you're planning? Um, uh, yes, so for example, in a bulk tumor, when you uh, analyze the tumor um, coronality, you can look at the heterogeneity there. Um, and um, I think um, it's certainly possible to look at through like point mut mutations, you can build up a like phylogenetic tree of the tumor and looking at what's the early event, what's a later event um, to, to build a time course. And for the um, um, chromosome instable tumors, sometimes because it, everything happens so quickly and um, the cells that comp competed out um, will quickly form a clone. And um, normally they are more like, like a monoclonal tumor. So they are, um, don't have that much uh, heterogeneity. And in that time, you may need um, some other method to, to, to look at the time course, time course of the events there. Thank you. Great. So let's also have some more um, questions for everyone, um, also coming from the audience. Um, so one of the questions is, do you think all cancer researchers need to be computational experts today? What do you all think? Siting, do you want to start us off? So maybe I can only um, 
talk a bit more of my personal uh, like point of view. Uh, I, so for me, I, I really enjoy uh, being able to um, have the freedom of uh, essentially taking whatever approach I think uh, that is the best approach to tackle a problem. Um, uh, yeah, I think it's like, uh, uh, so this is, I, I think one did my PhD uh, in a much simpler system, which is a bacteria and the circadian clock, a very elegant, uh, it's a three protein machinery. Um, this is uh, quite more uh, feasible, uh, relatively feasible back then uh, to be able to learn a lot of different techniques uh, and to tackle problem. I think in cancer, it's definitely a lot more complex problem and it's sometimes um, quite challenging to be, uh, to know everything. But to me, I think I've been still very, like most excited about uh, really acquiring all the skills that I need, but also being able to learn a lot from all the uh, experts in, in many different fields. So it's a very interdisciplinary approach that you're mm -hmm. um, that you're going towards. What about the others? What do you think? Um, does one does it require quantitative uh, computational experts today, or is there room still for people who actually don't take at all a computational approach? I honestly don't think that all cancer researchers need to be experts in in, in computational uh, tools. I mean. I honestly think that it's worth trying to learn and developing some tools with that. You're not going to lose your time by doing this. There are so many things you can do with your computer right now, now that computers uh, developed so much in the past few years. So there's a lot of room to do several different things with computational tools. But honestly, uh, uh, cancer research is very interdisciplinary. So we still need uh, very good clinicians, very good biologists. And I think the most interesting thing is the interaction between all of them. So you don't really need to be an expert in computational tools, but if you have a good background so you can communicate well with someone who is a more is more expert in computational tools, that's gonna be super helpful. The same thing for, for a computational computer scientists, physicists, engineers, uh, with some background in biology and medicine, it's much easier to talk and to interact and to make collaboration. So I think it's something important. Great, thank you. I think this is really one of the goals here, right? To also educate others um, on the computational side and build a common language. Um, Hong, anything more that you would like to add to this um, very pointed question? Um, I agree uh, with Victor that I think um, there are plenty of computational tools available, like analyzing data. So I think the important thing is, is uh, when you have a, a good question and um, what, what area you want to understand what um, question you have, that's the important thing. And you look for the uh, method and the tools available to solve this question. I think um, you, can, you can do it that way. Great, thank you. Can I take a stab at that question? Please, actually, there will be also another question for you that has been asked, but yes, please. Okay. But, 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 but on this one, I think that, um, you know, if someone aspires to be a cancer researcher of the future and they don't have some degree of comfort with computational approaches, I think they're gonna be left in the dust and will not be successful. Of course, everyone should not and could not become expert computational biologists, and I don't think they need to, and that's not the right aspiration, but I think that unless everyone in the cancer research field increases their computational literacy somewhat, they're just not gonna be competitive and aren't gonna be um, part of a solution. Thanks, Todd. And with this, um, let me just thank again all three speakers um, for really, really wonderful talks. I think it was really exciting for me to learn you know, about, about all the research that is being enabled by the Damon Runyon Quantitative Biology Fellowship. Um, I think really funding in this area is super critical in order to build a new field at this interface um, of cancer research and then data science on the other side. 
And I think we've seen today, you know, that these fellowships are really building the leaders of tomorrow in this field that are, can, that can speak both languages and can really bridge between researchers on both sides, um, which Todd just mentioned, you know, how important this is really at this interface. And with this, I'm um, giving it back to Todd. Um, there is another question that, you know, you built, you um, mentioned this golden era of cancer research due to advances in biology, medicine, and technology. And so I think, um, People here would love to hear from you. What are the sorts of advances that you're most enthusiastic about over the next decade? Okay. That, that's a big question. I, I can try to take a stab at that. I think you know it's remarkable that we've been able to make any progress against cancer. I think if you really think about it, you know how little we've really known about cancer biology and what makes cancers. Um, form and and progress and respond or not respond to therapy because we've only been able to get very narrow views into uh, into this this tumor biology. I think that's changing now, where we can get much more comprehensive views um, uh, and systematic views of cancer biology that we could never get before. And so I think and that I mean I think the speakers today all touched on that, the, the ability to look not just at, you know, your favorite gene uh, for a mutation, but look at the entire three billion letters of the genome um, and do that systematically across um, many patients. That's certainly an exciting new capability. The ability to similarly take systematic views of cancer vulnerabilities to not just know, you know, what are the mutated genes in a given tumor, but what are all the genes in the genome um, on which the tumor is dependent for survival? That points to you know, a, a systematic approach to identifying therapeutic targets um, for the disease. We didn't used to be able to do that, but now with CRISPR um, and other kind of genome editing um, uh, approaches, that's now possible to do. We used to have to totally ignore the important interactions between tumor cells and the um, microenvironment, the other cell types in the tumor. We used to, you know, actually throw away all those other cells, the immune cells and the fibroblasts and, and, and those kind of cells because they were kind of getting in the way of studying the tumor cells themselves. And now um, we know better and we have tools to be able to look at all of the cells in a tumor and to study those interactions. And they're really, really complex. And so that's, you know, as we heard today also, we're only going to make progress on understanding those tumor microenvironment interactions as they relate to um, why cancers develop and why some tumors respond to therapy and some don't. If we can take a really quantitative, systematic computational approach to understanding those relationships between cell types. I don't think cancer biologists just staring at the data are going to get us there because it's just too complicated. Of course, there'll have to be old fashioned, um, you know, follow up experiments to um, prove hypotheses that are generated by these kind of quantitative systematic approaches. But now we can see into tumors in the way that we just never could um, before. And maybe the last comment on this. Um, um, question is that I think we're moving more in the direction of being able to collect more data from the clinical experience. I mean, you know, Vitor's talk just reminded me how crazy it is that we kind of give the same dose of anti-cancer drugs to everybody, even though we recognize that, you know, the metabolism of those drugs is really different from patient to patient. Uh, and we could be learning more from that clinical experience. So as we get to aggregating electronic health records and combining that at large scale with genomic information and other, you know, imaging, um, you know, CT scans and MR and, and, and so on. That's going to be a, a really rich, um, fertile field for, for discovery. So I think there's a lot that's possible now that we couldn't even imagine before. And uh, shame on us if we can't, as a field, figure out how to turn that new capability into, you know, really important uh, discoveries. So, and, and maybe just um, also just to say again, uh, really exciting talks. Great to hear about um, uh, all your work and 
really a, a great demonstration of uh, what Damon Runyon stands for to really be unafraid to invest in bold, courageous, um, creative young people um, trying to break new ground. And it's great to see that uh, happening with your work. So thanks so much for sharing it. Maybe Young, are we back to you? Yes, so we're just about out of time. And I just want to close with a huge thank you to um, all of you, um, to Todd and Caroline and all of the members of our selection committee for um, their leadership and guidance in creating this very important award program that enables us to support um, amazing young scientists like um, the three that you heard from today who are really going to make Make incredible progress and advances um, against cancer. Um, I'd like to also, you know, say that our board of directors is phenomenal and they have encouraged us to um, designate support to these areas of need. And this is really the way that we're going to continue to fulfill our mission of providing these brave and bold scientists with the resources that they need to be able to make these future breakthroughs against cancer. So thank you to all of you in our audience for joining us today. And from all of us at Damon Runyon, take care, be safe and be well. Thank you. Bye-bye.